Good morning, I'm Ben Cohn. This is my AP Calculus exam. Last time we talked about limits. This time we're going to talk about derivatives, intermediate value theorem, and continuity. Not really in that order, probably the reverse order. But this is the second class, and we're going to get started with a little bit of review. So, first question, review question. It's not really a review because we haven't really covered this. We'll go for it. The line y equals 5 is a horizontal asymptote to the graph of which of the following functions. So we're given an asymptote. So an asymptote is a line that, does it have to be a line? Could it be a curve? I'm going to say it's a line. For this case, it's going to be a line because we know that y equals 5 is a line. And it's horizontal, which means it's flat, which is a line. And the idea is our function will keep getting closer and closer to this uh, line, but never quite reach it. So let's say this is y equals 5 right there. So I guess I'd make this 5. This will be the x-axis. This will be the y-axis. But we're going to draw the graph, uh, this function, within horizontal asymptote. And you might be like, well, we really don't know a lot about this function. How are we going to draw it? I'm not going to do a very good job. And so the idea is I'm going to draw something that has all the required characteristics, even if it's not exactly correct. And then we'll look at the, our possible functions, the a through e, and see which one fits that. So this will be our function. I'll call it f of x right there. And we're going to look at this and kind of formalize the um, the characteristics of this function mathematically. Now, since we've only learned about limits, that's where we're going to go with this. So the idea here is, as this function goes off towards infinity, it gets closer and closer to 5, but never quite reaches it. That's the whole concept behind an asymptote. So what we're going to say then, at the limit as x approaches 5 of f of x equals 5. Is it 5? No. Limit as x approaches, oh, I just deleted the top of 5. Limit as x approaches infinity of f of x equals 5. <sighs> Completely backwards. So the idea as x keeps going this way forever, it'll eventually get closer and closer to this line right there, which is y equals 5. And so we need to find out which one of these functions, when we plug in x approaches infinity, equals 5. And that is going to define our horizontal asymptote. So now when we rephrase this question as, okay, which one of these has limit as x approaches infinity of f of x equals 5, this problem becomes a lot easier. So we just go through each one and kind of look at it and do a little quick mental analysis. So if we plug in infinity for this, we get y equals sine of 5 times infinity. Now, you're not actually supposed to write out infinity, but it's really convenient. And you can kind of mentally be like, okay, that's where this is going. So this is not a good formal proof, but you only get it maybe a couple minutes at best to uh, solve these sort of problems in the AP exam. And if you get too bogged down with formality in your work, you're not going to be able to answer the question. Um, these questions, they don't care what kind of work you do. They just care if you get the right answer or not. So if we look at the first one, plug in, it's really limit as x approaches infinity, but it's quicker just write in infinity. If you look at sine, it's really just the vertical component uh, as you're going around a circle. So it starts here, goes up there, goes down a little bit, goes back to zero goes negative, goes a little bit more negative, a little bit less negative, back to zero, and around and around and around. Where the top is 1 and the bottom is negative 1. So when you look at sine of a number, this value right here, it has to be between negative 1 and 1. So the biggest it can be is 1. And so then when we divide 1 by infinity, we're going to get 0. So th this value, limit as sine of 5x over x as x approaches infinity will equal 0 because there'll be 1 at most 
1 over infinity. And at least negative 1 over infinity, which are actually the same value, which is 0. So this will go towards 0. So the first answer here, this will can be right. Limit as x towards infinity goes to 0. All right. Now I'm going to clean up the board just a little bit. Remove some of our distractions. Oh, oh. Since we know the concept of what we're going for now. So first one goes towards 0. Plug in infinity here. We have 5 times infinity, which is much bigger than 5. And so this one, nope. Limit as x goes to infinity. y equals 1 over x minus 5. Well, this goes to 1 over infinity minus 5. Infinity minus 5 is just infinity. It's basically just infinity. So it's kind of like that game you're playing when you're a kid and someone's like, you're, you're a dummy face. No, you're a dummy face times 2. You're a dummy face times infinity. And you say, well, you're a dummy face times infinity plus one. Well, from a strictly mathematical sense, the dummy face infinity and the dummy face infinity plus one, same number. So this would be dummy face minus five, which I don't know why you just tracked off dummy faces, but you get the concept here. This just goes to one over infinity, which is zero. So this one will be a little bit different. So let's see here. So this would be uh, 5x over, we'll factor out an x, 1 over x minus 1. We cancel the x's and we're left with 5 over 1 over x minus 1. This is the equivalent function, it's just uh, rearranged differently. So now you can see that 1 over x becomes 1 over infinity, which becomes 0, which is negative 5. So negative 5 is specifically not 5, so this one is not the answer either. But it's much closer, much closer. It's along the right path. So we got all zeros, infinities, and a negative 5. And then we're left to, with the last one, which I assume is going to be the right answer because none of the other ones have been. So if we take a quick look, whoop, whoop, right here. Um, factor out in x squared maybe y equals x squared times 20 minus 1 over x. And that would then be over x squared. I'm going to put the 4 over here. So 4 plus 1 over x squared. The 1 over x squared, they will basically become 1 over infinities, or 1 over infinity squared, which is the same as 1 over infinity, because they will both be 0. One will just be more 0 than the other. The x squared will cancel, and we're left with 20 over 4, which is 5. So the answer then would be this one, E, because we take the limit as x approaches infinity because it's a horizontal asymptote. And if it was a vertical asymptote, then we do limit as x approaches an actual number. We'll, reason, we'll, we'll go through some of those some, um, later. But for this one, horizontal asymptote, go off towards infinity, and this will go towards 5. Let's take a quick look on Wolfram. So we have, whoop, 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 click, 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 20x squared minus x, do a little parentheses, do another parentheses, and it is divided by, was it 1 plus 4x squared? I think it was. Let's check real quick. 20x squared minus x over 1 plus 4x squared. Okay. 20x squared minus, okay. We'll see what the Wolfram tells us. Bum, bum, bum. I do love Wolfram. Okay. And so here, let's do from 4, 0, less than x, less than 500. 500 is pretty close to infinity. Kind of, sort of, depending on what you're, okay. So as we get closer, as x seems to get bigger and bigger, we get up here like 4.99 which is almost five, which kind of makes sense that it you kind of get this, you can imagine this horizontal asymptote at five. So it's never gonna get above five, but it keeps getting closer and closer. So it looks like this is the reasonable answer. So when I, if I was approaching this like on an AP test, I would do a lot less thought process here. I would just do it along the lines of, all right, I know something wants to approach infinity and I just go through each problem, click, 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 until I got to this one. Um, you really don't have the time to graph it. 
Um, and I try to avoid graphing when I can, just because it gives you another chance for error. Um, generally, when you do things by hand, it's easier to notice your mistakes. But when you put things in calculator, sometimes you overlook them, and it's just a human performance trap. Okay, so that's part of the review. Now we're going to move on to the idea of continuity. So there is a more formal definition of continuity, but the one I'm going to use is you just don't pick your pen up when you're drawing something. So the idea for continuity here is you have a graph like this, a function, and it looks like this. Well, that's continuous because you could draw without picking your pen up. Or something like this, whoop, whoop. Nope, not continuous because you had to pick your pen up to draw that. Or something like this, there's nothing there. That whole means there's not a number there, so it could be like 1. At 1, x doesn't exist. So if you had something like 1 over x uh, minus 1, x cannot equal 1 because then you divide by 0, universe explodes, can't be done. At least not more than once. And so the idea here then is this would not be continuous because you'd have to draw this, pick your pen up. You'd, even though you move over an infinitesimally small amount, you had to pick your pen up, put it back down, and go back over. And you're like, wow, that's not very formal. It's true. There is a more formal definition, not worth knowing. It's basically the same idea. And when you're talking about something like the AP test, you really don't have time to worry about all the formalities. You just need to get the correct answer. And so having the correct answer quickly is really what's important here. So go by the, go by the definition that you, for continuity is, whatever you can draw without picking up your pen is continuous. That then brings us to the idea of the intermediate, ooh, that was not intended, intermediate value theorem. So, whoop, click, click, clack, maybe this, okay. So if we have a graph like this, and the idea is we have a point A down here, and we have a point B up here, and we have a graph that is continuous that goes from A to B, like so, then there has to be, for every point C between A and B, you have to go through that C. And so the idea is you can't make it from A to B continuously without going through an intermediate point. That's the idea of the intermediate value theorem, that the intermediate value has to be reached if you go from A to B. And similarly, if you go from B to A. So if you do something like this, whoop, you have to hit this point C in the middle. And so it doesn't mean you only hit it once. You can hit it multiple times. You can It can be up, down, and then back up. And that's still continuous, but you have to hit it at least once. And that's the idea behind this, the intermediate value theorem. And I know... Um, it's easier to kind of look at this and think of, okay, IVT, because you'll see it abbreviated that way every now and then. Remember, I like to avoid uh, acronyms when possible, at least when speaking, Intermediate Value Theorem. And it's easy to kind of remember what it does, because like, okay, intermediate value, so you have a value A and B, and you have some sort of intermediary, something in the middle, you have a low value, you have a high value, you have an intermediate value. And the theorem is that if something is continuous, i.e. you don't pick up your pen, then you're going to have to hit that intermediate value when you go from A to B or B to A. Because you can be like, wow, well, now it's A is B, B is A, things switch, same idea. And so that is the idea behind the intermediate value theorem. Okay, so now we have all the tools we need to actually talk about what is a derivative? So at this point, we've already talked about what a derivative is um, in terms of, hey, derivative is just slope, which is true. The whole idea of the derivative is that it, it is calculating the slope. And so I'm going to put up a definition real quick. So we have, eh, I'm going to get to the definition. So we have x here and y here, and we have a graph that looks kind of like this. And so we're going to have a delta x, delta y, and we're going to look at the slope, 
which equals dy over dx, rise over run. And we're going to say that this dx, we're going to start here at x, and we're going to go a value, I'm going to say h, an h distance to the right. And so then that means that this, this point right here, no dots, this will be f of x. This point right here will be x plus h. Therefore, the y value will be f of x plus h. And that's that gives us right here the definition of the derivative. So the definition of derivative, let's say that h is really small. And so the, the definition of derivative is limit as h approaches 0, gets really small, of f of x plus h minus f of x all over x plus h minus x. And so we look back at our picture here, it's like, all right, so we do rise over run. So the rise will be the big one minus the small one, f of x plus h minus f of x. Now you might be thinking, well, does it always have to go up like that? No, your slope can be negative, and that would give you a negative slope. But if you have a positive slope, the big one will be f of x plus h. And then we have uh, part of the run, we have x plus h minus x. And your thought process might be like, well, wait a sec, can't we just cancel out one of these x's here and just have it h on the bottom? True, and most people do. Um, I like to write x plus h minus x because it helps get me grounded in what I'm actually doing here. But you're right, you can just be like, mm, h. Okay. So this here is the formal definition of a derivative. This is everything, pretty much everything you need to know to do calculus. Um, yeah, it'll take a lot of groundwork to build up some of the other ideas. Nah, it takes a lot of groundwork to build up some of the other techniques. All the ideas, well, they're pretty much right here. This is, this is what calculus is. So let's try a problem real quick. Eh, kind of tangential. We'll try one. So keeping in our mind a uh, definition of the derivative, and then what we know about um, limits and continuity, we'll look at this problem. And the problem is, if the function f is continuous at x equals 3, which of the following must be true? So one of the first things I do is I draw a picture of the function. And you're like, well, all you know is that x equals 3. It's like, well, then that's the only part I really have to kind of get right. And it's continuous. So we know continuous and x equals 3. So it basically means I can't pick up my pencil, and it has to go through 3. So something like this. So we have 3 here. And this will be the x-axis, this will be the y-axis, and at x equals 3, it's continuous. So which of the following must be true? So first one is f of 3, so that value, whoop, start, I'll do blue, the value right there, f of 3, is less than x approaches Hmm. No. So what this is saying is, okay, so the limit as x approaches 3, so looking at something like this, that can be something like comes up here close to 3, and then there's a jump. So it could be, this is the idea of a limit as x approaches 3. So a limit as x approaches 3, the actual value at x equals 3, can be something totally different than f of 3. This could be f of 3 right here, where it's way up way up high. This is the y value, if you will. But since it's continuous, we know that we can't do this sort of jump here. This has to be, so this would be allowed for the limit of uh, x approaches 3, which is this. But because the left and the right side have to both equal each other. That's the idea of a limit, as you approach on the left and you approach on the right. They have to be equal because we, part of the definition of a limit is limit as x approaches 3 minus equals limit as x approaches 3 plus. This is from the left side, from the right side. And then that will equal the limit as x approaches 3, which is what's being said here.
And so that's why you have the left side the same, the right side the same, but the middle can be different. But since it's continuous, we can't do this jump here because we have to keep our pen uh, basically on the paper at x equals 3. And so it, f of 3 cannot be less than, I guess, when you say less than, it probably be down here. Same idea. Since the um, since we can't pick up our pen, this cannot be true. It has to actually not be less than, it has to be equal to. So if you're, this is what we're doing because we're continuous. We have the limit as approaches from the left, limit approaches from the right, and it has to be right there in the middle because it's both the limit and continuous. So the first one, not possible. So that one, first one, A, not correct. Get rid of those, get rid of that. Ah, so many dots, it's okay. Moving on to B, the limit approaching it from the left does not equal the limit approaching it from the right. Well, we know that it's continuous. So again, we have, since it's continuous like this, here's three. If we don't pick up our pen, we can't just jump and then jump back down. It's it's physically impossible to do with a pen. It could be a sharp sharp point here, but we have to um, we can't um, come up here, have a hole, have a point up here, and then continue on. And so the idea here is no, since it's continuous, the limit as x approaches from the left has to equal the limit as we approach it from the right. So that's not B would not be possible either. Whoop. So we have f of 3, okay, which is right here. f of 3 equals the limit as x approaches from the left. Yep, from the left over here. And limit as x approaches from the right, right there. Yes, so I think this one is possible. The derivative of f at x equals 3 exists. Okay. By the graph we drew, it totally does exist. And so if you think of the derivative, think of it as slope. And so it's saying that the slope exists at f of x equals 3. That's true, but that's because I didn't draw my graph to be, I guess, ornery enough. So if I draw something like this, this would be continuous at 3. So this is 3. This still has the limit and f of x. But at this point, the derivative does not exist at 3 because you don't know what it could be. So you're like, well, do you take the derivative, derivative from the left side, which would look like that, or do you take the derivative from the right side, which would look like that? And so since there's that ambiguity on what the derivative could be, we say that it doesn't exist. And so the derivative of f of x at 3 might exist, probably exists, but we don't know for sure. And so that can't be the correct answer. Derivative of f is positive at x, negative 3, and negative at x greater than 3. Well, we'll look at this graph that we drew. This is saying that the, we have a positive slope on the left of, no, we have a negative slope on the left of 3, but a positive slope on the right of 3. So something kind of like this. Um, not necessarily. There's no, no reason why that has to be true. And so the correct answer for this would be c. Now, that's a pretty tough question. And you can see how it kind of really digs into the nuance of, hey, what does limit mean? What does continuity mean? And it gets into a lot of details where it's easy to get tripped up. So the big takeaway from this is, well, for a limit, the point that you're actually looking at, in this case, x equals 3, doesn't have to exist or it doesn't have to exist at that point. Um, but continuity means you have to draw the graph without picking up your pen. There's a more formal definition, but it's tedious, and not picking up your pen is actually the most useful definition you can have for continuity. And so when you look at, all right, can't pick up my pen, and the left and right side have to meet each other, then it really kind of limits on what the possibilities can be here. And this helps you drill down. And you kind of have to go through this quick, too. That's, that's a lot of information to process in a small amount of time. Okay. So now at this point, we have looked at a couple examples of the way these questions are asked. And we even gave the formal definition of a derivative right up here. So the question is then, well, how do we use this? 
Well, there's various notations for derivatives. So the idea is derivative is slope. So if you're like, all right, we have a function f of x, let's say it looks like, let's say something like this. We'll say this is y equals x squared. And so f of x would be um, the function f of x right here. But then you could look at the derivative and the derivative then of x squared would be 2x, which might look something kind of like this, y equals 2x. So this would be f of x, and then this would be written as f prime of x. This is called a prime, it's just an apostrophe. There are different ways of writing the same thing, which is um, the derivative. So as a quick sidebar, f prime of x equals dy dx, would you also see, which is slightly different, but for our case similar, you'll see partials as well. So you can see partial y, partial x, which means take the derivative only with respect to x. By this point, we're only working with um, single variables here with a y as the dependent variable and x as the independent variable. So for our cases, this will be the same. You can then also take multiple derivatives, like a derivative of a derivative. So if you want to take two derivatives, you do f double prime of x, or you do d squared dx squared of y, and you, you see something similar with partials. And then you can go more f triple prime of x, and then usually they don't go past three apostrophes. After that, there's like, well, f four of x, and so forth. And so that's just the idea of notation. So when you see that, don't get too worried. And usually they're pretty, questions are pretty clear of, all right, this is the second derivative, this is the third derivative, etc. Okay? And so the question is, how did I find out that y equals 2x sort of thing? Well, everything you can do, there are three rules, more or less, with derivatives. So we have the power rule, whoa, power rule, the product rule, and the chain rule. I know this sounds like a whole bunch of information. The challenge here is that I'm basically giving you information for the entire semester right here in like 10 minutes. So it feels like I'm giving you a lot, and that's kind of true but there's no easier way to really break it down. So the first one we're gonna talk about is the power rule. So the power rule, all of these, these rules are just shortcuts for this definition of a derivative. This definition of derivative that we had, we can then use this to do anything we want to do. But it gets kind of cumbersome and there's some shortcuts we can take. That's where you have the product, the power rule, product rule, and chain rule. And so the power rule is something along the lines of, if you have an f of x, and that equals x to the n, then f prime of x will be n times x to the n minus one. And the broad process is like, oh, okay. So when you have x squared as f of x, and then f prime of x will be 2x to the n minus 1, which is 1, which is just 2 times x. Similarly, if we have, let's say, x to the fifth, the derivative of that would be 5x to the fourth. Not too bad. Uh, 6x squared would then become 2 times 6, which would be 12x. 6x becomes... Uh, 6 times 1 times x to the 0, which is just 6. And that is the power rule. But the idea is like, well, where does that come from? Well, I'm going to show you how to derive it. Not really so much that you know how to derive it, but so that you understand that this isn't magic. That this is just the a quick, simpler way of doing the definition of a derivative. And so we're going to start out with... 
f of x equals x to the n. And so we're going to look at um, f of x equals x to the n, which would mean that we also have f of x plus h equals x plus h to the n. We also have x plus h and we have x. So we have some sort of graph looks, let's say, like this. This will be x to the n. It could be x squared, it could be x cubed, it could be x fourth. Probably not uh, just x because it looks obviously curved. But I'm just going to say not drawn to scale. Okay, so this gives us what we need to uh, find the derivative for the, um, by the definition of the derivative. So from this case then, we would say, all right, f prime of x, make sure I got a color that interests me, ooh, blue, baby blue, f prime of x would equal f of x plus h minus f of x all over x plus h minus x. Now this is the definition of a derivative. Okay, so x plus h will be x plus h to the n. f of x would be x to the n. Then we can simplify x plus h minus uh, x on the bottom to h. Now, the kind of tricky part here becomes, oh, ooh, purple, darker blue, slightly darker. We want to expand this out right here. And I'm going to use the concept from Pascal's triangle. So one way to quickly expand binomials is Pascal's triangle. So we have something kind of sort of like this. 1, 4, 6, 4, 1, 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. Where you just add up the two numbers on the um, to the top left and top right of it. So 4 is 1 plus 3, 6 is 3 plus 3, 4 is again 3 plus 1. And what this does then is this gives you the coefficients for, let's say, x plus y to the nth power. Where this is n equals 0, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, this will be 4, this will be 5. And so the idea here then is if we do um, x plus y to the 0, this is just going to be 1 because that's all it is, anything to the zero power will be one. But let's say this is x plus y squared. Then we'd have x squared, where the x squared y to the zero plus x to the first y to the first plus x to the zero y squared. And the idea is these exponents here will always add up to this value of n. And so, okay, y to zero, that's just going to be one because any of that anything to the um, zero power will be one and then the coefficients will be since it's two one two one one two one and so rewriting this similar to be x squared plus two xy plus y squared and this is pretty common knowledge for us we can take x plus y multiply by x plus y we foil it and we will get this result out well, we can do this with bigger numbers too. So like for three, we have x plus y whoop, cubed, we would get x to the three, y to the zero, x to the two, y to the one, x to the one, y to the two, and then we'd be left with an x to the zero, y to the three. And our coefficients in this case would be one, three, three, one. 1, 3, 3, 1. Rewriting this in a more, I guess, conventional manner. So simplifying it, if you will. And these are all added together. We get x cubed plus 3x squared y plus 3xy squared plus y cubed. And that's how you expand uh, x plus y to the third. And you can go on as far as you like here. One thing to note here and I'll erase this just to kind of simplify life. 
One thing, eh, I hate just missing small pieces. Okay, one thing to notice here that's interesting is you always have ones on the outside. And furthermore, the second letter, or the second number in is always gonna be whatever N is. So you have two, or one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and I'll keep going down, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So when we expand this out, I'm gonna expand out this binomial as, so we know the first number is gonna be one. It'll be x to the n plus, this will be n x to the n minus one times h plus, and then it'll be some number, I'm gonna call this a3, just over a number that's something, doesn't involve x, times, ooh, let's see here, this will be, hmm, hmm, this will be times x to the n minus two times h squared, and I'll do plus dot dot dot, clean up my real estate slightly, go back to my purple, and then the last term will be h to the n, okay? And then that's going to be the expansion of this binomial right there. Then we take down our minus x to the n, divide everything by h. So simplifying things a little bit, we have an x to the n here and we have an x to the n here, those cancel. We're gonna factor out an h. And so we're left with h times quantity n x n minus one plus a three, which is just some sort of coefficient, we don't know what it is, time without x involved. And I'm just hoping it's gonna cancel out, which is why I am ambiguous about what its actual value is. x to the n minus two, we, have, we only factored out one h, so we still have an h there, plus dot 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 dot, h to the n minus one. That dot 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 means we just continue on, so forth all over H, get another color to emphasize the canceling. And so these H's disappear, they cancel, F prime of X equals, okay. And it, we have, this is the limit as H approaches zero. So this value right here is being multiplied by effectively zero. So this will go away and all of them will go way down until you get down to uh, zero to the n minus one, which is effect effectively gonna be zero still. And the only terms we're left with in the end will be n times x to the n minus one. So this is the power rule. Let's do f prime of x. So for f of x equals x to the n, the derivative f prime of x will be n x to the n minus one. That is the power rule, and it's worth memorizing. Whoop. Move it over here, back to our main area. I'll erase some of the, clean up some of my real estate here. And so that is how we took our definition of the derivative, we plugged in an f of x, a, a power rule, x to the some sort of constant, and we get out a, um, a rule that we can use over and over again. So to practice with this a little bit, we already did a few. So we have x cubed, well that would go to 3x squared as the derivative, where the slope of x cubed at any given point would be defined as 3x squared. The, 3x to the ninth would be 27x squared, 2x then just goes straight to two. And that's the idea behind the power rule. So you should, you should memorize the power rule, but the big idea that I really wanna get across here is this power rule just comes from the definition of a derivative, which in the end is just rise over run when you take the limit of the run, the x value or the h value here, as that approaches zero. So the limit is h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over the quantity 
x plus h minus x. And so you can use that to find a, any derivative you want. You can actually find the derivative to anything. Once we'll get over to integrals, you'll find out, okay, you can't take the integral of anything in life. But for derivatives, you can. You can always take the derivative. Um, you can always work your way through it. You can always use this formula. Now, granted, the um, things get kind of cumbersome and tricky at points, but it can be worked through, and there's enough uh, rules. We, well, next time we'll go over the product rule and the chain rule that they can help you work through things. But it all stems from this. Now, usually we won't use the actual definition of a derivative to solve things very often. Usually we'll use the rules that we get from it, uh, power, product, and chain, to find the derivatives. But it's really good to keep this in mind of, all right, nothing is magic here. If I was stuck on a deserted island with nothing but sticks and mud and, uh, I don't know, I guess coconuts and palm, palm trees, you could figure this out. You could work your way through it and solve any sort of derivative you wanted using just the definition of a derivative. Okay? So now let's take a look at a problem to kind of summarize some of the you know, concepts, feelings, ideas that we've gone over. So looking at this problem, we have a graph here, graph of f, function f, whose graph is shown above, check. It's defined on the interval negative 2 to 2, uh, negative 2, yes, it seems reasonable. Which of the following statements about f is false? Which means most of these will be true, ideally. Okay, so looking at it, Function f is continuous at x equals 0. Okay, so x equals 0 is right here. And yes, it looks like you can draw that without picking up your pen. So that's the definition of continuous. You can draw it without picking up your pen. So is that true? Yes, totally true. f is differentiable at x equals 0. This one looks like it's probably going to be false because if we zoom in on our graph here definition of a derivative is slope or so when it says is differentiable means the derivative exists at that point and it looks like it probably doesn't so if we look at the derivative coming from the left and we get something like this look at the derivative coming from the right and we get something like that and since they don't equal each other it's like well which one is correct? We don't know. And there's a sim there's a uh, level of ambiguity there. And when you have that ambiguity, the derivative does not exist. So if you can't be like, that is the derivative, that is the answer, then the derivative doesn't exist. And so it is not differentiable at that point. So it's probably, this one is probably false. So I'm going to go on a quick tangent real quick. So when we found the definition of a derivative, we had our graph like this, look something like, let's say like that. Nah, that's too extreme. Too extreme. Green. Something like that. That's nice. And what we did was, we're like, all right, here is x, and here is x plus h, and we used this right here, this x plus h, and this, um, this x plus h minus uh, x, which then just gave us h, and then we had our values up here of f of x plus h and f of x. And we use this to find the derivative at this point right here, right there. And the thought process might be like, wait a sec, why didn't we use x minus h? Why did we have to do plus there? Why couldn't we do x minus h and then find find it using this side here we, where we have uh, negative h and we have f of x and f of x minus h. It's like, why do we have to go to the right side? And wouldn't it be even better if we took this one plus that one? So we did f of x plus h minus f of x minus h divided by, and we do, what is it? Um, x plus h minus x minus h. It's like, that way we kind of have the best of both worlds, half one way, half the other way. 
And you're right, those those would all work actually. We could go to the left and use f of x minus h instead of f of x plus h. And we can use x plus h and x minus h. And we, can, we could totally do this average. We could do it using this one. Huh? Need more contrast? More contrast! We could find this value to estimate it there. We could find this value to find the derivative at this point x. Or we could use this whole segment right there to find the uh, derivative of at point x. The idea is they're all these are all just approximations of the derivative of that point. But since h gets infinitely small, this becomes an infinitely good approximation. And all of these, all three of these methods that we talked about right here, they're all infinitely good approximations. Therefore, therefore they are all if, they're, if you have an infinitely good approximation, you have an exact value. And so when you take the limit as h approaches 0, these are all going to give you the exact answer. So these are all different ways of approximating it, which when, when you take to its logical extreme, is going to be the exact correct answer. So long story short, yes, if you, you could use any of these ideas as a definition of derivative, but the reason we use... Um, the f of x plus h minus f of x instead of something like x minus h is this it's generally just easier to work with when you have one value and it's positive it's easier to work with two values or a negative value so that's why we use positive h and we start from x so you're right to question that and you're right to think hey it's like is something going on here the reason that it works is because they're all just different approximations and when you get an infinitely good approximation by taking the limit as h approaches zero, it all becomes infinitely good. And so you might be like, well, if we use plus h and minus h, it's a little bit better. And sure, it might be a little bit better, but you're talking about infinity versus infinity plus one. When you get out to that extreme, it's all actually just the same. So if you were wondering, I know crazy tangent, back to the problem. That's why we use uh, positive h instead of minus h or a combination of the two. So that's why f is not differentiable. This is false. Because we have two um, options. Now, if you were crazy stressed for time and you know you had 10 minutes to do 30 problems, I'd be like, yeah, b is correct, move on. Because I'm pretty confident. But with that being said, if you have a little bit of time, it's good to go through the rest of the options just to make sure you're not doing something crazy here. So f has a critical point at x equals 0. So a critical point is where we haven't talked about these yet. We will. We haven't yet. Critical point is just where you, where you can have a minimum, minimum or maximum. So we do have a minimum there and that is a critical point um, there are different definitions of critical points um, this is this is true but you ha kind of have to be careful about what kind of definition um, people use for uh, critical points um, the one that would work best for the AP exam is a critical point where there can possibly be a minimum or maximum therefore if you have a min or maximum there it's going to be a critical point. Now, that plays a little bit differently than um, absolute. So you can be like, well, here's a maximum over here, but that maximum is only there because the graph just kind of abruptly cuts off. Usually that would not be considered a critical point over at x equals 2, though. Okay, so that would be true. f has an absolute minimum at x equals 0. Yep, this is the, as far as we can tell, the graph. That looks to be the bottom part. And absolute versus relative means, relative means to the parts around it. So this would be a relative minimum, but this would also be a relative minimum. And this would be the absolute minimum because that this relative minimum is less than that relative minimum. Therefore, it would be the absolute minimum. But then you can have something like this comes back down again. That would be the absolute minimum. Generally, the way you find absolute max or mins, you need to look at all the relative max and mins and find the minimalist of the mins. 
and then you also look at the endpoints too, just to make sure that the endpoints don't actually go lower. So that is true. Concavity of the graph of f changes at x equals zero. Concavity, we haven't talked about it yet, it has to do with second derivative. The idea with concavity is if it can hold water or not. So the idea here is if it holds water, then it's positive concavity. If it can't hold water, then it's negative concavity. So the idea here is if you had this part right here on the left and you poured water from the top, it would just run down. It's like, oh, okay, that seems reasonable. Now from the right here, if you took this and you basically mirrored it over, you would get some sort of shape that looks kind of like this, like a bowl. And then if you poured water in there, it would pool up and you would be able to collect water. So that would be positive concavity. This is positive concavity. This is negative concavity. And so yeah, there is a change of concavity at zero. And that's the idea of how you go for concavity. So you could have actually gotten this problem correct just based on what you know, even though if you, you might not have understood what some of these other definitions meant. But you, you can tell that F is not differentiable at zero because drawing lines coming from the left or drawing slopes coming from the left, drawing slopes going, coming from the right, you're going to get two different slopes. And that ambiguity means that it is not differentiable, that the derivative does not exist. And that's the idea so far for, we talked about the intermediate value theorem. We talked about continuity, which means not picking up your pen. And then we went over the definition of a derivative, the formal definition. And we saw how we could use that to derive the power rule. Next time we'll look at the product rule and chain rule, and that'll pretty much cover most of the rules we have for derivatives. And from there, we'll use derivatives to find cool things and look at some of the possibilities that we can do with derivatives. Thanks for coming by. I will see you guys on the next one. Thanks.